We started looking into a broad spectrum of R&D trends. Now we will be looking uh, in a more focused way into each of the segments that FIRE covers, the six segments, with the help of policy officers from the European Commission. So the focus of this uh, discussion now will really be about how can we incorporate Earth observation in the different stages of policy making. So uh, with me on the stage, you can see uh, Christos Fragakis, policy officer in DGRTD. You can also see Luca De Michele, policy officer at DG Grow. Um, and for those that can actually see the screen either behind me or in your laptops, you should be able to see Doris Maka. She's a pro program officer in DG Agri. So welcome to Doris as well. Um, you can see Zoe Costadinu from DG Mare, Gerardo Herrera from DG Grow, and Electra Papadaki, team coordinator in DG Grow as well. So a warm welcome to all of you. Um, we will also do this discussion in waves. In the first wave, we will be looking into policy, but in an EO agnostic way. So which are the directions that policy is going to, in general, forgetting about EO for a minute, and then we will see how EO can be incorporated to support some of the main directions that uh, policy is taking in the future. So um, I would actually like to open the panel with Luca, um, asking what are the key policies that will drive the development, in your case, um, for wind energy? Thank you. Good morning. Um, I am Luca Di Micheli, and uh, uh, I'm dealing with energy within DigiGrow. Uh, obviously, DigiGrow uh, is responsible for industry, so for industrial deployment, and therefore, we mainly focus on the energy part related to supply chain, uh, manufacturing, and so forth. And in specifically, I follow wind energy. Uh, I follow also uh, geothermal and biogas. I've been asked here to uh, speak about, uh, about wind energy. Uh, what we will do in the next five, 10 years, actually, it is uh, very clear uh, what are the challenges ahead as well as the, the work. Uh, very recently, you may have been informed that uh, um, the European uh, Union has approved the implementation plan of Repower EU. Uh, since the war in Ukraine, uh, the perspective has changed dramatically, and energy has become uh, the, probably the top priority of all other policies in, 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 uh, for the European Union, and not only for the European Union. Uh, this Repower EU plan uh, envisages that we get rid of Russian gas in, in practice. So, build on the fifth 455 package on decarbonization, and, uh, uh, but focuses uh, not just on decarbonization, but in practice of getting rid of um, um, Russian gas uh, as soon as possible. That a 10 year plan, uh, and uh, as for wind energy, it is foreseen that. Uh, around 500 gigawatt are going to be built uh, of new of new uh, wind farms uh, uh, within by 2030 it is a, an amazing effort if you think that currently uh, we have uh, about 200 gigawatt of uh, uh, installed energy in the european union about 250 if we count also norway uh, uk turkey etc so we have uh, more than double uh, our our current capacity um, and uh, um, currently we are deploying about 20 gigawatt gigawatt per year uh, whilst repower you requires about 35 38 per year so we, really it's a huge huge shift and uh, we will have to work on several uh, really big challenges uh, first of all, we have to work <clears throat> on uh, slow permitting. That is what is in administrative burdens that are those that are really uh, impeding the deployment of, of, these, uh, of these technologies. But there are several other uh, aspects that have to be considered that might also be relevant for you. Uh, if we have to deploy so much uh, wind energy, there will be a huge uh, demand uh, for raw materials and also for technologies. Uh, only well, about 5,000 new wind turbines per year will have to be installed. We expect many of them to be offshore. And uh, 
we expect, for instance, we have assessed that uh, about 1,500,000 uh, 1, tons of steel per year will be needed within the European Union. But also we have to think about uh, the uh, wiring all these offshore uh, farms to you. So copper, that is already uh, a critical <coughs> raw material with, which prices are skyrocketing, will become, will become absolutely something to look at as well as uh, uh, permanent magnets. Permanent magnets are, are necessary to, to run, uh, especially offshore wind turbines, because it makes the system much uh, uh, easier and efficient, but they are all produced in China. And also China controls uh, uh, almost completely uh, the neodymium production, and neodymium is an, an essential rare earth mineral for, for the wind turbines. So the challenges that are had are many, many, many. And as for Earth observation application, there are several uh, aspects that uh, might be uh, discussed. I think we'll, we'll come later to that. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much. And actually, uh, you, you mentioned raw material. So I would jump directly to Gerardo, who is uh, covering this, this part and is connecting online. So if you can tell us a little bit what are the uh, key directions that in general, raw materials, of course, in connection to wind energy, but more broadly are taking. So do you hear me well? Yes, I suppose. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm Gerardo Herrera. I'm coming from Energy Intensive Unit and uh, Raw Materials in DigiGro as well with Luca. And as Luca was talking about before, it's about the energy transition. We are speaking about our Green Deal objective, that is to achieve climate neutrality and a digital economy, and for that, as Luca was saying before, we need to secure access to those critical raw materials that are needed for those strategic economic sectors that will produce this transformation. Immobility, renewable energies, digital security, space for Earth observation. And the current geopolitical context with the Russian aggression against Ukraine is adding pressure. We are witnessing a growing instability to the current geopolitical uh, situation and context. And we see how the world and the EU is exposed to a greater supply risk, supply disruptions, shortages, and price hikes of energy and various key critical raw materials. So as these supply chain disruptions may become more frequent, we need to act. We need to reduce this risk and try to reduce the concentration of the supply, because in, in many of these critical raw materials, they are critical because we need them for this energy transition, but they are also critical because they are sourced by few countries. And this is what, the, what is going at the end to guide the policy angle for the next 10 years. We need to reduce that. In fact, uh, the political momentum is so important for raw materials now that in March 22, the head of states called the European Commission to secure the EU supply of critical raw materials by means of, first, it would be the international dimension, trying to secure strategic international partnerships with uh, resource-rich countries that want to develop a sustainable and responsible mining. Also, raw material stockpiling and promotion of domestic sourcing, and third and very important, the circular economy and resource efficiency. So this is, uh, in fact, what was the message from the member states' uh, representatives, the, the presidents and the governments. And in May 22, as Luca was saying before, there was this Repower EU communication where it was announced that we will intensify the work in the Commission on the supply of critical raw materials and prepare a legislative proposal. And again, the objective of, of this legislative proposal, or one of them, will be to identify mineral resources in the EU, and not only that, but uh, to develop critical raw material projects that are of a strategic interest for the EU in the EU for, for uh, domestic sourcing. So these, these projects will focus on both the primary sources and the secondary sources of raw material. And of course, they need to account for the highest level of environmental protection because sustainability is at the bottom line of our green and digital transition to achieve climate neutrality. And if we want to achieve that mining is done in a sustainable way, 
in a responsible way with the environment, we believe that Earth observation can play a big role there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gerardo. And we will come back in a second um, on the EO incorporation. Um, since the theme in, in both first interventions was very much influenced by the recent geopolitical um, situation, I would like to open the floor to, to Doris, because agriculture is also, and, and food security in particular is also an area that can be very much affected. But of course, there are other drivers pre-Ukraine war that are uh, setting the tone there. So if you can guide us through that. Yes, thank you. So I'm Doris Marquardt from DGFB, Unit F2 Research and Innovation. And you're completely right. So agriculture as a sector is framed by multiple factors. So on the medium long term, you have the environmental conditions, societal expectations, you have climate change, you have the markets, but you have also agriculture is embedded into supply chains. So at the normal, you would first think, okay, it's a common agriculture policy, which is a key focal point in the European Union, also from a budgetary point of view, is the main driver influencing the sector. But um, that may, on the medium term and long term, let's say, be a key role. And that is a policy which you can rather plan and foreseeable for the farmers as it regards income support. But then all several other policies, not only trade and markets, um, but also as we learned today, energy, digital, innovation play a crucial role for the development of the sector. So let's um, elaborate on some examples. So let's say two years ago, as the Green Deal was published, everybody would have said, okay, agriculture is not only influenced by the common agriculture policy, but also the Green Deal ambitions by the farm to fork strategy, the biodiversity strategy, and zero pollution. So and to some extent, those policies, the environmental demands have been mainstreamed to the common agriculture policy, but they will also in the environmental policies at European and national level, directly and indirectly influence agriculture production. Then in addition, you have, let's say, the market requirements and prices. And now very concretely, if you have, for instance, also the energy markets, um, you see how it's all the thing interrelated. To name concrete examples, actually the energy sector um, influences the agriculture sector and its development twice. So energy is a key input to agriculture production. On the other hand, um, agriculture outcomes are also used, for instance, um, to produce energy. So for, all, um, let's say, for energy production, bioenergy, for instance. And there's always then the discrepancy and to decide when do we use it for food and one, for instance, um, let's say for energy production, if we have for wheat or reap and so on. So that is the discrepancy and their decisions have been taken by policymakers, whether they steer and decide on it or not. So in so far, energy policies are still relevant for the agriculture sector. But um, I would also like to point to innovation, digitalization, data policies, and to innovation and technologies, I would also regard, let's say, Earth observation. So the ships, for instance, and the dependency on some digital technologies, um, their agriculture is also affected by the supply chains. So we have a lot of machinery. So if ships, like in the car industry, are, let's say, getting rare, it also impacts, let's say, the agriculture production. Maybe not that severe because you can keep the machinery on a longer term, but it's also impacting the agriculture sector. In addition, innovation and digital technologies, we had it already mentioned, help to perform better and to, let's say, get accounting for the environmental requirements in line with digital and green transitions. So for instance, through position farming, their digital technologies can help to contribute to the sustainability objectives and requirements for the sector. So, and then data, for instance, is strongly related um, to digitalization in the agriculture sector. Subsequently, also data policies 
will influence the agriculture sector. And finally, with research and innovation and technology, let's say we can help out the performance of the sector and therefore directly and indirectly influence it, particularly through cost-effective solutions, which can be deployed at larger scales by, let's say, a larger number of farmers, not only by the technically advanced ones and the larger ones for scale effects, but also by smaller ones. And we, are, we may also think beyond Europe, because a lot of small scale farming is also taking place on other continents. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Doris. Um, I would like to stick a little bit to the food security angle. And of course, again, it's not the singular angle there, but uh, maybe passing the floor to Zoe Costandino from Digimare to give us a little bit of the sort of marine maritime perspective. Thank you. Um, Regarding Digimare, the main policies that are going to uh, drive us in the next 10 years are, of course, as you said, re related to sustainability of uh, resources that are coming from the ocean. So sustainable fisheries management is on the key, uh, on the center of our activities, uh, but also, uh, but not only, also sustainable agriculture uh, and uh, the development uh, of the sustainable blue economy sectors that are going beyond uh, food. Uh, ocean is... Uh, going to is, is in the center of the Green Deal uh, through the development of uh, innovations in food like algae, aquaculture, through other kind of innovative aquaculture, through the development of the offshore energy sector that was already mentioned, and through the great need to have better knowledge of how to manage ocean systems that are in a very large extent still unknown. So for from the perspective of DG Mare, uh, Earth observation, both satellite and in situ, is in the center of our work. Marine knowledge is in the center of our work. Uh, it's it's not uh, um, uh, by by. Uh, this is why we also have the data collection framework that collects information for fisheries around Europe. But also, this is why we manage the European Marine Observation and Data Network that brings together information on in situ. Uh, observations uh, across Europe. So uh, these are the main policies, and I, I there, there isn't one uh, policy sector that uh, marine knowledge is not important for. I would like to bring also to the attention international ocean governance, because usually we, when we speak about mare, we speak about fisheries, but mare goes beyond fisheries. Uh, so for international ocean governance, also marine knowledge is in the center of the pillars that are driving it. We need to expand our good practices of knowledge in the international domain. Uh, we need to know more about what is happening in the Arctic and how we can manage it better. Uh, we uh, also um, working in collaborations in, uh, the, in the framework of the UN uh, decade of sustainable ocean science for of uh, ocean science for sustainable development. So uh, Earth observation, as I said, is in the center of our work. Uh, besides fisheries management and besides also. Uh, regulation regarding fisheries in European and international waters. Uh, it contributes to decision making regarding marine spatial planning. And marine spatial planning uh, is covering all the blue economy activities. And last but not least, currently uh, with the development of the mission Restore Our Oceans and Our Waters until 2030, we have the development of a digital marine knowledge system that is going to be the digital twin ocean that is going to provide a tool based on marine knowledge exactly in earth observation uh, and uh, in situ observation uh, in order to provide alternatives and knowledge and assessment of scenarios for the future of our oceans and its sustainable management. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, we will probably touch again upon some of these topics that you uh, introduced at the very end. Um, I would like to pass the floor to Christos, who is sitting here with us, Christos Fragakis from DGRTD, who could uh, share a little bit of the situation with Urban. Thanks very much, Lefteris. <laughs> Good morning to all of you. Thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity. To speak to you, I will not speak to you about a particular policy, but I will talk to you about a new initiative that contributes to all the urban relevant policies. So I'm going to talk to you about the city's mission, 
So the climate neutral and smart cities mission. Probably you are well aware of that. A mission, it was a new way of delivering, if you like, uh, so solutions to great challenges. Uh, so we have a mission on the ocean, we have for the uh, climate neutral cities, we have for cancer, uh, climate adaptation. Uh, so the cities mission in particular has got two objectives. The first one is uh, how to deliver 100 climate neutral cities by 2030, hugely uh, ambitious objective, a blunt objective, but hopefully achievable with a big question mark. And the second objective that is closely related to the first one is how those 100 cities can become role models to inspire other cities, the other European cities, to become climate neutral at the later stage, that means 235, 40, and not after 250, of course, because we have the Green Deal. Now, the why we have a mission of cities? Well, you know probably better than I do. Well, three out of four uh, citizens, they live in the cities, the European cities, uh, cities, they live in the cities. The urbanization is expected to increase even more. So we expect 85% of the European citizens to live in cities by 2050. The cities are heavy consumers of energy. They consume 65% of the global energy consumption. They emit about 70% of uh, uh, green, uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions. And then uh, they contribute to depletion of uh, uh, natural resources and the rest of that. So huge challenges, all of them interrelated somehow in the very, very complex uh, environment. Now, cities mission, it is positioned, it is rooted in horizon, to, uh, horizon Europe, but in reality, it goes far beyond research and innovation. To address the city challenges, you have to address it from a systemic approach. So you, you must address the regulations, you, you must address the policies, you must address all the different aspects that are related to the cities. Now, areas, policies that are related to the urban environment, there are many, you know, because simply of the multidimensionality of the, the cities in life. So we have the Green Deal, of course, that is to, to, to make Europe the first the, the European continent, the first continent, uh, the carbonized co uh, co uh, continent in the world by 2050. Then you have this uh, zero pollution uh, 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 initiative. You have the fifth for, for uh, the fifth of 50 sites, uh, 56 uh, 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 package, the biodiversity strategy, all of them are related and they have to be addressed in a holistic integrated approach, as it was mentioned. Now, where do we stand as far as the implementation is concerned? <laughs> Back in the, uh, Horizon 2020, we had the call to create a platform that is going to assist the cities uh, to design, to roll out uh, transition pathways to reach climate neutrality by 2030. Now, the, there is a consortium, a platform that is already established. It's called the Net, Net Zero Cities. Now, it is being led by the Climate Kick. Uh, it has 33 partners from 13, 13 uh, member states partners with a very, very diverse profile. So it's not only expertise in climate, sci climate sciences, but also in the regulations, mobilizing uh, uh, citizens, because citizens' engagement is considered, to, is considered to be at the very center of the whole initiative. Then communication, uh, 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 you know, all, all kinds of different, so engaging the, the societal actors to engage in the, in the climate neutrality initiative. Now, in order to select some cities that they are determined to reach this objective, the 2030 climate neutrality objective, we had the call for expression of interest back in, in November. A deadline was uh, the 31st of January. Now, it was overwhelming response from the cities. So we received 377 proposals from cities that are determined to reach climate neutrality by 2030. That surprised us quite a lot, to be quite honest. Now, we evaluated those expressions of interest with independent experts. Then based on the assessment of those experts, the commission has selected 100 cities that were in a better position, if you like. Now, these 100 cities it's not only about how well prepared they are. We try to address uh, the huge diversity that exists out there in the European urban ecosystem. So 
geographical balance. We have cities from all member states. We have large cities. We have the capital cities, smaller cities with some competence in areas like digitalization, for, for example. And what are we going to do with that? These 100 cities, they will have to design the so-called climate uh, uh, city contract, uh, which in reality is not a contract. It's just a memorandum of understanding that has to be signed by the mayors or re uh, competent representatives that they can engage their cities. And those cities, they will have to engage to design this uh, climate city contract that comprises, first of all, the political vision of the city, then a climate action plan, and then an investment policy, how they want to fund all the big investments that they have to make in order to become climate neutral. Do I stop here and then in the second round to I think I would appreciate that we okay. stop for a moment and we also give the floor for the initial intervention to Electra Papadaki from DigiGrow to um, bring actually a very relevant, let's say, perspective from the infrastructure side. And then we can go back to uh, look into how to integrate EO in the different policy areas. So Electra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate. Uh, so I also work in DigiGrow uh, with my team. We are responsible for the construction sector, a sector very important in terms of uh, economy for uh, Europe, uh, but also a sector that through uh, what we deliver contributes greatly to, to the climate emergency. So buildings are 40%, uh, consume 40% of uh, energy in Europe. Uh, they are responsible for 36% of CO2 emissions. And in terms of raw materials that uh, my colleagues brought to the picture, uh, they are responsible of half uh, of uh, the weight of raw materials extracted. And uh, they, they generate um, when demolished and uh, sometimes during construction as well, one third of waste. So you understand that um, in the situation that we're going through, that uh, with all the challenges that uh, we saw um, with the pandemic and uh, now with uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, um, construction uh, is really seeing the effects of the shortage of materials, of the raising uh, prices of energy. And of course, this is something that passes to, to the consumer, to the building user, and affects the quality of life of all Europeans. And uh, if I may say, in the whole world, we see the effects. So in terms of policies, uh, we have been working since the beginning of this commission uh, towards a very big ambition to renovate as much as possible of uh, Europe's building stock. Uh, to turn uh, buildings energy efficient, uh, so uh, they consume less resources. And on the same time, we're working through different initiatives uh, in order to reinforce circularity, uh, to, to have a better handling of construction and demolition waste, and also a more sustainable use of uh, resources and secondary materials. Uh, another great challenge and opportunity for construction buildings and infrastructure is digitalization. Construction as a sector is uh, one of the least digitized, and this is something we see also in the buildings and in the infrastructure. Um, we have been working for years with member states and the industry in order to make information available digitally, uh, to make processes digital when it comes to procurement for infrastructure projects, when it comes to management of projects, of buildings, of uh, bridges, of roads, etc. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an ongoing work that uh, I think it is of high relevance also uh, for Earth observation. And I, I think I'm going to, to close my initial introduction here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Electra. Um, I think we all heard different aspects of the ambition of the vision that the European Union has and, and the different initiatives that the European Commission is taking. Um, one of the themes that I'm keeping is that it's all pretty much interconnected, not only to the geopolitical situation, but also to this greater vision. So we will now see in this next part, how can Earth observation play a role in delivering this mission? Um, I should ask Veronica if we can also open the question to, um, to the audience that will be visible and, and um, accessible through Slido. So the question there would be, in which specific application areas do you believe introducing Earth observation in regulatory or legislative um, documents and, and, and aspects is most needed? So this will be running throughout the discussion that we'll be having now 
uh, with the different policy officers. And with that said, I would like to um, follow up now with Doris. So Doris, agriculture is one of the earliest and most comprehensive adopters of Earth Observation Solutions. The most notable example, of course, that pretty much everyone in this room and in this meeting knows is that it has been integrated specifically in the uh, Common Agricultural Policy Monitoring Approach. Where do you see Earth Observation bringing the most value in your sector? Yes, thank you. And thank you also for pointing to a success story. Um, I think for agriculture, we have to consider that there's dual interests. So from the private domain and the public domain. And you just mentioned one key example, how Earth observation can facilitate, let's say, policy implementation very concretely. So in that case, you're referring to Earth observation allows to reduce the number on auto spot controls by having, let's say, ongoing monitoring and change detection of Earth observation and satellite data. And here, we discuss it internally, clearly we see future potential as well. So meaning to increase the strengths and the capacities of automated change detection, ongoing monitoring to reduce the number of controls. And one crucial point here, I think what is most worthy to be mentioned, um, the supply chain from research to innovation to actual deployment and having it let's say, in legislation accepted as a control mechanism. That was a key here to introduce really the introduction of the mechanism of Earth observation and CAP implementation. So, but we have other application cases in policies and in the sector. So we also use Earth observation to the generation of indicators. So that's not about controls, but really about policy monitoring Relation, for instance, the stock taking um, and the interpretation of satellite imagery as it regards landscape features that is work in progress, but it's quite important because on the medium and long term, it may reduce reporting obligations. Another important point for agriculture for the sector, but also for public policies, is really harvest monitoring, crop monitoring out of the fields because market forecasts depend on the monitoring of the crops and the status. And for instance, particularly in situations where you don't have local, locally generated data, like now, for instance, the, the wheat chamber of the Ukraine, there, for instance, satellite um, interpretation becomes quite important to assess the market potential at the harvest. And then there's another point, which is also of dual interest, private and public, that is the input of Earth observation to farm management information system. And why is it of interest not only, let's say, for the private sector, for the farmers themselves? Because as mentioned already in the first round, Earth observation and precision farming, for instance, where Earth observation forms an input, let's say, as data, as information, can achieve efficiency gains and so far also enhance the environmental performance of farms. So in farm management systems, earth observation is a crucial factor as well. So we are seeing, let's say, the portfolio of instruments and products, earth observation products, let's sum it up, the evolving. But what is a very crucial factor for us is the interpretation. And there, as looking ahead for the 10 years, um, to have a key input there for policy support, but also for the private sector to make it affordable, that will be a key challenge. And we have still to work on it to get the needed reference data from the ground and situ data and to produce the algorithm to become better in the interpretation of satellite data. And um, that said, I would like to point to one flagship initiative from the European Commission um, several GGs are involved. This is a so-called Horizon Europe Candidate Partnership, Agriculture of Data. That's actually an inherent objective to use database solution in agriculture to support sustainable agriculture production, but also public policy monitoring and evaluation through the use of earth observation data, other data, and data technologies. So, and that might be of interest for this community in particular, and as we are running out a little bit in time, I will stop here. And if you are interested in that initiatives, for sure, you can reach out later on as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doris. And, and it's nice to see that for a sector that is already a heavy user, you have lots of plans and ideas of how this can be further uh, done. 
Um, I would like to pass the floor to Luca. You actually mentioned a very ambitious goal of increasing the capacity, um, the energy capacity that is produced through uh, wind energy. How would you see Earth Observation supporting that? And is it something that can even really enter into the, the policy domain as such? Well, as for entering the policy domain, this mainly will depend on your community. So on your capacity actually to develop applications that are uh, marketable. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think that there are really things that there are, uh, um, there is a potential. Uh, most, uh, several of you have been working with me in the past, especially on GMES, Copernicus, but also GEOS. You know that I am uh, mainly focusing uh, on, on in-situ observations. I know that your community is more on remote sensing. I think that remote sensing especially is very much uh, useful for uh, the future development of uh, wind energy. What we expect is uh, that these uh, farms uh, to be mainly developing in the next years offshore. Uh, therefore, monitoring uh, with in situ data will be more difficult and more costly, whilst remote sensing can provide uh, uh, aid from this point of view. Also, we expect uh, these farms to be bigger and bigger and the windmills taller and taller. Uh, we are uh, um, anticipating uh, a height of the windmills over 100 meters on average, even uh, about uh, under 30 meters. So there are going to be huge uh, farms with uh, very, very high towers and uh, therefore also uh, models uh, uh, will have to be revised to monitor in the situation, also to anticipate uh, the, the wind uh, conditions and the meteorological conditions there. Uh, also, there are uh, aspects that uh, are uh, known but not yet uh, properly addressed, especially the environmental impact assessments of these farms. Uh, so how much they will affect the, especially the hydrometeorological conditions uh, uh, at sea level, at ocean level, and uh, the, the moisture and the humidity flows up, up there. Um, uh, also, uh, should be we should foresee uh, renewable energies to uh, take over uh, overall. So not just with energy, but also all the other uh, applications that will probably combine among them to increase efficiency. So, for instance, for offshore wind energy, we might expect uh, a tidal and waves uh, uh, energy to be probably combined with uh, uh, with um, uh, windmills, uh, and this also uh, will require studies that Earth Observation can provide. Uh, also, uh, wind energy will be mainly used to provide green hydrogen. Green hydrogen, we don't yet know what technologies will provide to transport green hydrogen, but will very likely either be uh, through ships, uh, if it is going to be imported towards Europe or using the existing gas pipelines readapted. However, hydrogen is a very uh, important greenhouse gas, so we don't want it to, to, uh, to leave, uh, for instance, the, the pipes through which it is transported uh, until it is burned, and therefore uh, the capacity to uh, detect a possible uh, uh, possible leaks leakages of, of hydrogen is very useful so all these applications can be translated into operational activities in favor of uh, wind and uh, renewable energies thanks thanks a lot uh, many many interesting points um, and also the, the combination of different energy sources is, is, is definitely a very interesting one um, I would like to pass back the floor to Zoe. You already actually touched on some of the points where you see Earth Observation supporting Digimara initiatives. Um, I would actually maybe want to add a little bit of a provocative spin. Would we see a similar incorporation of EO as in the CAP in the Common Fisheries Policy? And if you can expand from there. Uh, I, I want to start from the fact that uh, MARE already uses Earth Observation in the implementation of its policies. So uh, Earth Observation is used, for instance, in fisheries uh, and controlling aspects of fisheries. 
related uh, um, to marine vessels, for instance, related to um, illegal, unreported, and un unregulated uh, fisheries. Uh, so Earth observation is already uh, uh, used uh, in through MARE and through the agencies that MARE is uh, collaborating with. Um, of course, uh, Earth observation is going to, to be incor incorporated in the common fisheries policy and the common fisheries policy has a very strong knowledge base. So there is the knowledge base that comes from in situ observations that are happening specifically uh, for the policies and then there is the potential for use of satellite observations uh, in order uh, to enhance this dynamic. We again need here the development of services that are going to be uh, directed to the sector uh, because the sustainability of the fisheries management is a very important aspect of, of uh, the MARE policies. But I don't want to stay there and we shouldn't stay only in policies uh, on, on fisheries. Uh, fisheries is, uh, is a, an important part of the protection and the restoration of the marine environment and biodiversity, but it's not the only one. And the way that the blue economy is going to develop uh, in the next decades is quite important. Uh, we need space and we need space for energy. We need space for the sustainable production of food. And this space is going to come from ocean. Uh, the colleagues in energy already mentioned the potential uh, of offshore uh, energy development. And this is going to be also uh, supported by aquaculture. And then uh, their earth observation is very important for the sustainable marine spatial planning, for the selection of the areas, but also for the identification of uh, um, other parameters that are related to quality. Uh, for me, earth observation coming from satellites is going hand by hand with in situ observation. As I said, for MARE, the development of knowledge-based uh, uh, tools is very important. Uh, and the development of the digital twin ocean uh, based on Copernicus Marine and Imotnet, so based on Earth observation, based on ocean observation, is going to provide uh, answers and potential for investigation and assessment of multiple policies uh, related both with fisheries uh, and the restoration uh, and protection of marine environments and its biodiversity, uh, but also with other sectors of the of the blue economy, including marine transportation. Um, I would like here to mention that the, the emphasis that MARE is giving to Earth observation, to observation in general, is underlined by the development of an ocean observation initiative that will allow uh, uh, Europe to be more, more transparent regarding its observation, and this, I believe, will create also a lot of synergies with Earth observation because it will allow for more application and for more knowledge coming uh, from the ocean. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, thank you very much. You, you definitely did. Um, I would like now to, to go back to the urban uh, discussion. And actually, it's interesting because while we're discussing the uh, Slido poll is ongoing, and uh, I see that some of the uh, inputs there are actually looking into the urban part. So you mentioned some of the initiatives you have been uh, um, working on, especially the cities mission. What would be in practice the way for Earth Observation to support these initiatives? <clears throat> Uh, well, let me as I said before, the city's mission is going to implement through these 100 selected cities. Now, it is a bottom-up approach. That means it is the cities themselves that they will have to define what the challenges are, and it is the cities themselves that they will have to define the solutions. Now, the Earth Observation has a very critical role to play to help the cities, first of all, to identify what is the baseline, what is the starting point, if you like, against which progress is going to be assessed. The second thing is that uh, the vast amount of data that cities, I mean, uh, uh, Vangelis made uh, my task much easier because he identified already the challenges. So to help the cities how to tease out uh, from these vast volumes of data to see which data are rele relevant to a specific application, to implementation. The other thing is how to integrate data in order to integrate as much as possible the sectors. 
you have the built environment, you have mobility, you have energy, you have transport, you have food, you know, you have so many sectors that they are inter, there is a, a, a interconnected, inter, uh, interacting with like uh, the city uh, scale. So how to come up with holistic approaches addressing the system overall, this, the urban ecosystem, rather than components of that. And then, huge evangelists also mentioned that, is the monitoring. How to, monitoring, to monitor continues the, not only the greenhouse gas emissions, but also the co-benefits. It's very, very important in addition to the emissions to, for citizens to see what are the co-benefits that uh, engaging to climate neutrality will bring to their everyday life. So you have quality of uh, air, for example, you have green spaces in order to sequestrate uh, carbon, how this green uh, spaces is going to improve the quality of life, it's going to make, uh, to, to enhance the well-being of the citizens, because the citizens, when you talk to them about climate neutrality, doesn't mean very much. But when you talk to them about uh, quality of life, air quality and the rest of that, is there where they can associate and therefore they can buy in and engage in this process to to towards climate neutrality. Okay, so again, baseline, uh, continuous and rigorous uh, uh, monitoring of the progress. Uh, and then uh, as you assess the progress, of course, there will be space again, you know, to redesign, to adjust the solutions. It's not going to be everything cast into the, I mean, the, the climate neutrality challenge is so huge, it's so complex uh, that it's not going to be just planning at the very beginning, you forget about that. It has to be a continuous uh, iterative process, designing, going, uh, uh, assessing, evaluating and going back to the design board, if you like, for adjustments. No, indeed, and actually, this gives me the nice opportunity to say that this is precisely what the FIRE Forum is trying to, to achieve, to have this area to discuss and, and be able to create these feedback loops between those that use the technology and those that, that develop it. Um, moving on back to uh, raw materials and, and Gerardo, uh, an EO expert himself. So where do you see EO solutions entering into the roadmaps that your unit and, and your activities are developing? Thank you very much, Lefteris. So let me start by talking about the critical raw material action plan. In this 10 action plan that was published together with the critical raw material list in 2020, we were publishing a set of 10 actions to try to secure access to this necessary critical raw material for the green transition. And among these 10 actions, I think that there are at least three that could directly benefit from the uptake of earth observation technologies for the raw material sector, because we are targeting to map primary and secondary sources of critical raw materials, because we have an action that is saying to deploy earth observation programs and remote sensing for exploration, operation, and post-closure activities. And maybe the most important of them all is because in this action plan, we want to promote a responsible and sustainable mining of critical raw materials. And as I was saying before, we think that the earth observation technologies can have a major role there. So let me explain to, to you what we believe Earth observation data products or services could do to support the raw material value chain from the beginning to the exploration to the post-closure activities. So speaking about EO solutions, what are we talking about? We are talking about improving mineral exploration at regional and local scale. And I think that more than ever today, I think in the previous session, you were speaking about the hyperspectral satellite missions. Now we finally have the MMAP satellite mission, and this kind of sensor will certainly help us to improve the mapping of mineral resources and critical raw materials. If we use very high resolution optical satellite imaginary, we can monitor the volumes and the rate of the extraction of material in open cast mining, but we can also monitor and track how the mining waste deposits are evolving. We can use also these uh, technologies to map sources of secondary raw materials using, for example, land use cover classification methods. We can try to identify urban landfills and mining waste areas that can be reprocessed, recycled, increasing this circular economy concept that is very important for us. We can use Earth observation also for mapping illegal mining through the chain's detection analysis. 
And I think it was also said in the session before, now that we have this satellite radar interferometry new product for Europe, the European Ground Motion Service, we can use satellite radar interferometry to map and monitor ground instability in active and abandoned mining areas to enhance the environmental uh, security. This is uh, very important with this uh, European Ground Motion Service. We have free access to the ground deformation in Europe, and I think it's really applicable also to the mining areas. So these would be some EU applications that we believe could really be beneficial for the raw material sector. And this is why from the Commission, we are supporting these developments, these innovations through Horizon Europe. We are supporting innovation actions where we are trying to develop this earth observation technology for the raw material sector. And we will keep on supporting this idea because we, we believe that we have an opportunity, a great opportunity to develop this cloud-based online processing services and tool that can really make a difference for achieving our goal that is uh, the sustainable uh, mining activity in Europe. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Gerardo. I, again, you, you touched on each of the uh, key points that can be supported with Earth Observation. Um, finishing this part with Electra, I'm sorry that <laughs> you're again the last one, um, definitely not the least. So we have heard about climate neutrality, sustainability, digitalization. You are very much involved in these activities. And this is also, you mentioned yourself, a key part of how the construction building infrastructure sector will evolve. Where do you see EOR and the activities fitting in that? Yes, um, first of all, uh, I think my job is easier because my colleagues have uh, given such a good introduction. All of these topics linked to urban planning and uh, raw material extraction are very important and relevant for construction. Uh, but in addition to those, um, in terms of, uh, of, of construction buildings and infrastructure, uh, we see a lot of uh, potential in the monitoring of uh, the progress of big uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, this uh, will enhance accountability, of course, and uh, citizen engagement, among others. Uh, but also another issue that we face with uh, infrastructure and construction <laughs> is uh, the one of uh, maintenance. Uh, across Europe, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, big infrastructures that are uh, in very bad condition and uh, uh, just uh, knowing how this happens uh, and also what are the effects of different climate emergency events or earth earthquakes to them uh, would uh, help a lot the construction sector to react quickly and the governments, of course, to react quickly. Uh, certainly, we miss a lot of data as well uh, for policy making. Uh, it was mentioned uh, by many of my colleagues, and this is the case also for construction and as a result, buildings and infrastructure. Uh, although uh, buildings and infrastructure are made uh, and uh, we see them and they last there sometimes for hundreds of years, uh, we are really missing a lot of uh, data on them that we could very easily get through Earth observation. Uh, it is uh, easy to, to, to even uh, calculate the type of construction or the year of construction uh, through Earth observation of a building. So there is a lot of potential there. And um, certainly Earth observation can uh, help us a lot uh, in uh, different adjustments that we can make in buildings, uh, such as green, green roofs, solar panels, and uh, different installations that uh, we can make them in an informed way and really uh, increase uh, the effect that they can have. So uh, I think there is a really a very big room for collaboration between uh, uh, Earth observation and construction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Electra. Um, I think this wraps up this part of the discussion. Um, my feeling is that we have collected more information that we can handle right now, so we, we would need another hour to be uh, discussing the different threads that we have touched upon. Um, I'm also looking at what has been raised over the, uh, the question we have, we have issued in Slido, and just for the benefit of those that cannot see it, there are all sorts of ideas about where EO could be uh, incorporated in regulation or legislation. This includes things like um, ecosystem monitoring, uh, monitoring of man-made assets as well. I, I guess it's exactly what uh, Electra was just talking about. Uh, the Water Framework Directive, urban areas um, that would actually 
be, uh, I guess, deployed for the totality of uh, local authorities, emission schemes, soil, um, EU solar initiative, ESG as well. Uh, that's quite, quite interesting. Marine plastic, deforestation, and so on. Deforestation is actually an ongoing uh, thing right now. Um, with that, I would actually like maybe to take advantage of the fact that we have six very active in this uh, um, sort of interface between policy and innovation uh, area officers and ask beyond Horizon Europe that you have all at some point or another referred to, are there any other areas, any other initiatives where you would see direct integration of EO in the technological solutions that would support what you're doing? And here it's basically, yeah, if anyone, maybe first from those that are sitting next to me, and you, you can easily see my reaction. Yeah. Well, uh, as I said before, I mean, there are many, many initiatives, policies that are related to, to urban uh, environment. So biodiversity was here, you know, I mean, uh, you, you know, what is the ecosystems, the, their behavior in the urban context, uh, how to restore them in order to, that they can, uh, we can uh, enable them to uh, deliver the ecosystem services. Uh, then uh, you have uh, the built environment that it was mentioned already, already from Electra. Then you have the SDGs, SDG 11 in particular, that we have to address. So sustainability overall and not only climate neutrality, you know, although they are not so different uh, be between them. Uh, then, uh, you know, the pollution, very, very important, you know, the how to uh, get uh, zero pollution, for example, to, to achieve this uh, objective. And pollution, is, there are so many different sources for the urban context. So, it's a you know multiplicity of sectors, uh, multiplicity of sources of uh, emissions, uh, uh, pollution, etc. All of them they have to address to be addressed somehow. Then at the end of the day, how to have implementably implementable data sets that the policymakers can work with, because you know it helps them. It doesn't give them any help if you have so many data that they don't know how to do with that. But that was already mentioned from previous speakers, I guess. So for the Earth Observation Community, that is a well-known challenge, I guess. Yeah. Anyone else from the panel who wants to jump in? Just maybe for me to clarify a little bit. If there is any other instrument that you are going to roll out, apart from Horizon Europe, where you would see R&D projects that would also have a, a space for Earth observation. So that, for instance, the members of, of ERSC that were here or all those that are connecting, all those that develop uh, EO solutions, know where to bring their innovation. That is beyond Horizon Europe, uh, but still related to the urban context. Uh, so the platform that I mentioned before, they will uh, uh, launch, they will publish annual calls uh, for large scale demonstrations again tailor-made to cities. I believe that there is going to be a huge opportunity for synergies between your community and the cities that will apply for that. So bear that in mind, they will publish one call you know, very, very soon, probably next week or the week after. So there, there are funding opportunities as well. But there you have to collaborate with the cities. So you know, it's not at the EU level, but it's at the city level that you have to reach out and uh, seek for synergies. I see Doris and Zoe. Uh, maybe Doris, you want to go first? Yes, thank you. I think um, even without explicitly launching, let's say, explicit or uh, dedicated um, programs, if you look at the requirements and if innovators, let's say, broadly some up innovators, be it startups or um, researchers, can demonstrate the added value of using Earth observation and the cost um, reduction potential in the public administration then they automatically will come also the calls from the public administration and even from the private sector itself as for instance in farm management systems so for instance um, we have a mixture um, from the agriculture side and like the, for the farm sustainability tool which is at the moment also at the exploration phase um, at a European level, but all the member states will be required to develop a similar tool and offer it to farmers. So there are similar initiatives which will also require expert inputs. So I would expect from the public administration also forthcoming interest and expert input from the different sides. And there it will be, let's say, making innovation ready for deployment. Zoe, if you... 
Yes, besides seconding what the colleagues already said, uh, for Mare, we have the Blue Invest platform where innovative ideas can actually be led to, uh, to uh, deployment and uh, applications that are based uh, in Earth observation and ocean observation are very welcome in all sectors of the blue economies, including fisheries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Gerardo? Uh, thank you very much. So. Before I was speaking about how to secure access to critical raw materials, one of the angles is the development of strategic international partnerships with countries that are equally minded with us, trying to develop a responsible and sustainable mining. And we think that we can bring, we are trying to bring sometimes our earth observation technology for the raw material sector in these international partnerships. Um, as for funding, the uh, Repower You plan uh, concerning wind foresees uh, the implementation of the so-called EPCEI, so important project of, of common European interest. These are huge projects uh, that uh, will be launched uh, to support uh, the renewable energy sector, in particular the wind sector. Um, just some basic information that you might not, not have. Uh, the, the EU is still uh, world leading in uh, technologies for the wind energy. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we are shutting down companies and factories because uh, the Chinese are taking over. The uh, European uh, Commission has uh, uh, implemented several anti-dumping measures against China, uh, also against uh, uh, Morocco and Egypt uh, on, on, on specific uh, uh, materials and components. Uh, nevertheless, the competition is very, very high. So uh, the idea is to support uh, the wind, uh, the wind uh, in the EU, wind in manufacturing industry as more as possible. So this EPCI will be one tool. And also we are looking at the um, the temporary crisis framework that has been used for uh, COVID, also to re-adapt it uh, for specific areas of renewables. So for you uh, teaming up with the wind uh, industry uh, for these uh, large actions might be a possibility. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Luca. And thank you to all of you. Both the panelists, you, you have, I think, given a lot of food for thought and, and a very nice vision that has been uh, created in, in a world full of challenges, clearly. Um, thanks for all of you for sticking for this uh, almost two hours <laughs> of uh, moderating these two first uh, panels. Uh, I think the next part would be actually lunch here. Um, and you will also be seeing on the screen here and also on your screens uh, in, in your computers the uh, very nice drawing that has been prepared with all the key points that were discussed here. So once again, uh, a big round of applause for all those that contributed. And yeah, we will continue at two o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>